I've always hated labels, as I'm sure many of you do. Before I had contacts, I wore glasses every day, and I remember when I was younger, my friends used to jokingly call me Four Eyes. Along with that, I grew up in a predominantly white neighborhood, and so being Asian was a big part of my label as well. Both my glasses and my race became a large part of my identity to others, and I often felt like I was seen as a stereotype rather than being seen as my own person. Even though many of the stereotypes could be considered good traits, growing up with these expectations of these stereotypes still did some damage to me. As you can see, I don't really wear glasses much anymore, and to this day, I still sometimes struggle to find the difference between who I am and who others expect me to be. I know that many others probably have similar experiences with labels and stereotypes that I did, and if you have had these experiences, I want you to think back on them and ask yourself how it made you feel. To have someone define you by one or two traits rather than seeing you as your whole entire person. Now imagine if the traits that were projected onto you were negative traits that associated you with being dirty or disgusting or a criminal or someone whose entire life is a bad decision. This is what many individuals experiencing addiction face. Hi everyone, I'm Molly Zhang, and today I'm here to talk to you about the importance of changing our perspective on addiction. Going back to the labels, ask yourself what you've been taught to think when you think about terms such as drug addict, alcoholic, junkie, or crackhead. Unfortunately, a lot of people have negative views associated with these terms, and this doesn't just harm individuals who experience addiction, but almost everyone who uses substances, and even those who don't use substances. In short, these negative views will either directly or indirectly affect almost everyone. Today, I want to talk about the unfortunate way that many people still view addiction, the importance of changing these views, and how all of us can take what I'm talking about today to help move our communities into better futures. I'm currently studying neuroscience and mental health. And one of the first things that I want to emphasize is that addiction is not a choice. There are neurochemical and biological changes that occur following substance use, particularly prolonged or chronic substance use. And so it becomes a lot more complex than someone just making the decision to no longer use. Now I know that this topic can be extremely controversial. And while an individual can choose to use a substance for the first time, no one chooses to develop an addiction. Even with that, though, there are a number of factors that go into choosing to use a substance. And as a university student, I have felt firsthand the pressure that has been placed on me to use substances when I'm with my peers. And most of us are influenced by and influence others to engage in substance use. Substances are often also used as a coping mechanism when individuals aren't equipped with other ways to cope. And so even choosing to use a substance for the first time becomes complicated. Now, for anyone watching who may still believe addiction is a choice, or for those who believe it isn't, but aren't really sure of the mechanisms behind addiction, let's talk about the brain for a second. In your brain, there's a region that acts as a reward center. As you might have guessed, the reward center is activated whenever you receive a reward. And even more than that, the reward center has evolved to promote behaviors that are essential to our survival. Natural rewards include things like food. And so activating the reward circuit results in reinforcement, making it more likely for you to repeat rewarding behaviors. The main chemical involved that I'll talk about today is dopamine. When you experience any reward, dopamine will activate the reward center. When you take a drug, however, this dopamine release is increased by an incredibly high amount, and this results in a very powerful activation of the reward circuit, making you feel both extremely euphoric as well as creating very strong reinforcements that allow you to make associations with the situation in which you took that drug, remember that situation, and recreate that so that you can reach that extreme euphoria again. In addition to this powerful activation of your reward circuit, this big dopamine rush that is happening puts you way above what your dopamine levels are usually at, and so your brain responds by reducing the effect of dopamine that is naturally present. But when this drug is out of your system, your dopamine levels are still low, and so that's when you start to feel the opposite of euphoria. Short term, that's how things like hangovers happen. Long term, these low dopamine levels result in an individual needing to take their substance of choice just to feel normal, and just to prevent withdrawal symptoms. Now this is a very basic overview of just a little bit of what goes on in your brain. Imagine that though, but instead of these changes happening with just dopamine, they're happening with other chemicals as well. And instead of this just happening in one region of your brain, 
It's affecting numerous parts of your brain, as well as many other biological systems that govern the rest of your body's functioning. In addition to all of that, the same way that there are risk factors for other diseases, there are risk factors for developing an addiction or a substance use disorder. Genetic, environmental, and developmental factors will all contribute to an individual's susceptibility to both trying a substance and continuing to use a substance. A number of factors, such as family history, early exposure to substance use, exposure to high-risk environments, and certain mental illnesses, can all increase vulnerability towards developing an addiction. So I hope that this puts into perspective a little bit how there is so much more to addiction than someone just deciding or not deciding to use a substance. An addiction is a disease of the brain. There are biological and neurological underpinnings. And it's time for our perspective on substance use and addiction to reflect this notion that it is a real illness. Like any other real illness, those who experience addiction require proper support. Yet unfortunately, this is often not the case. And this is largely due to the stigma that surrounds substance use and addiction. It's almost too easy to both subconsciously or consciously put labels on people and push stereotypes onto people based on those labels. I get it because I used to do the same. A few years ago, if I thought about addiction, or even if I thought about anyone who did any sort of illicit drug, I would associate both with mainly negative traits, restricting people down into assumptions that fit common beliefs that I had been taught. So I do get how easy it is to do that. However, 21.6% of Canadians have met the criteria for substance use disorder at least once in their lifetime. That is a very large number. That is one in five people who at some point in their lives will have experienced an addiction. This means that every single person watching this at some point will very likely be affected by addiction, either directly or indirectly, if you haven't been affected already. It is also estimated that 8 out of 10 individuals with a substance use disorder say they've experienced barriers such as stigma and recovery. And even more than that, this isn't just people's well-being, it's also people's lives. Between January 2016 and December 2018, it is estimated that there were over 11,500 opioid deaths, which is heartbreaking when you think about just how preventable opioid-related deaths can be. The point I'm trying to make here is that this is something that affects almost everyone, whether you're aware of it or not. So if this is such prominent and such a common issue, why is it so easy to see in such a negative light? Well, there are two major reasons why the stigma surrounding substance use exists. The first is the lack of awareness and education. As mentioned before, there are a lot of people who still believe that addiction is a choice. It's easy to feel this way if you don't know a lot about how the body and how the brain works, and even easier to make this assumption if you haven't experienced it yourself. If you enjoy drinking alcohol a few times a week, but you're able to control how often and how much you drink, it's understandable to me how it can be easy to see alcohol use disorder as a choice. From an outside perspective, it can seem like those who experience addiction are just throwing their lives away or not trying hard enough or just making excuses. But as we've talked about today, I hope I've already debunked those claims a little bit. Because from an outside perspective, yes, it can seem like addiction is a choice. But from a health perspective and a scientific perspective, we know that that just isn't true. The second reason is that the stigmatization of substance use and addiction has become so common that it is everywhere all the time. Let's go back to what I was talking about earlier about labels and how harmful it can be to decrease the worth of a person to just one trait. Then connect that to what you've been taught to think when you think about an addict or junkie or any of the other stigmatizing terms that I've mentioned today. Combine those two together and think about how the harms of each will interact with each other. Let's give a broad example of this. In whatever scenario, think about a time that you may have referred to someone or heard of someone being referred to as an addict. That individual has now had the rest of their identity stripped away. When you say these terms and use these labels, it is easy to forget that these are people with lives and with loved ones and experiences the same as you and I. Rather than being a person who is complicated the way that all people are, they have now been reduced to one word, and it's one that doesn't usually have positive connotations. Saying just this, though, isn't nearly enough because it runs a lot deeper than simply not having positive connotations. So let's dive into it a little bit further. I'm sure that there are many of you who have heard someone say, or maybe thought or said yourself when encountering an individual who is experiencing homelessness and asking for money, oh, well, I don't want to give them money 
because they might spend it on drugs. Well, if you dig into that statement a little bit more, essentially what that's saying is that this person doesn't deserve help anymore because they might use substances. It's saying that rather than rehabilitation and support, those who experience addiction, which again, let me emphasize, is an illness, deserve next to nothing. So let's tackle these issues then before we continue talking about just how important all of this is. Once you've taken the time to learn more about addiction as a disease, it's still easy to contribute to the stigma surrounding substance use and addiction, and a lot of this boils down to the language that we use. Let's start with something easy, such as saying addict or other similar similar stigmatizing terms. These terms are all very common and terms that are often used in education, healthcare, policy, and day-to-day life. One of the biggest things that we've talked about today is the idea of labels reducing a person to one thing, taking away their dignity and humanity, and it's time to change that. Rather than referring to someone as an addict, it's time for us to start using person-first language, to put the person before the disease and start using terms such as someone with a substance use disorder. Not only does this shed light on the fact that addiction is an illness, but it also demonstrates how a person has this illness, rather than them being an illness. Additionally, I don't know if anyone's noticed that rather than saying substance or drug abuse, I've only stuck to saying substance or drug use. The word abuse is linked with violence, and so saying abuse automatically provides negative connotation, while saying use offers a non-stigmatizing alternative. Even saying that someone is clean once they've been in recovery alludes to the fact that when they were using substances, they were dirty. And now we have an illness symptom being associated with filth. Instead, this can be changed by saying that someone is no longer using substances. I hope that I've said enough here that you see my point. None of these words or phrases are uncommon and all of them can be harmful. So it's time for us to change our language so it's no longer harmful. Now you might be asking though, well, what's the point? Why is any of this really important? The thing is, changing our language helps change the perspective of yourself and of those around you and changing your perspective does a lot more than just that. Let's start small. Let's say you have a friend who is going through a hard time and they start drinking alcohol to cope. If you spend your time talking about how you think alcoholics are lazy bums, or if you make a joke about how you're an alcoholic whenever you drink, you could be associating negative traits to those who experience alcohol use disorder or diminishing the seriousness of alcohol use disorder. I think that we can all agree that either of those things could decrease the likelihood of your friend coming to you when they start becoming concerned about their alcohol consumption. In fact, it might decrease the likelihood that they talk about it at all. When you change your language to one that shows compassion, and when you talk about addiction like an illness, you encourage those who experience addiction to reach out for support and help treat their addiction. So that's how changing your perspective on substance use and addiction can help those around you. Going a little bit bigger now, maybe you don't think that addiction is a choice, but you're still using stigmatizing language and you're still hearing it all the time. This could contribute to you associating those who use substances with the negative traits I've talked about today, which could then lead you to believing that those who use substances may be less deserving than those who don't use substances. Building off of this, naloxone is a medication that can temporarily reverse the effects of an opioid overdose, providing more time for an individual to receive life-saving care. If the stigma surrounding addiction leads you to consciously or subconsciously think less of those who use substances, you are much less likely to get trained in how to use naloxone, which again, is a life-saving intervention. I know that some of you might be thinking though, well, this isn't applicable to you because you don't know anyone that uses opioids. But this could be applicable to you because I know of someone who encountered someone experiencing an overdose while they were waiting for the bus. Coincidentally and thankfully, about a week and a half before, they had undergone naloxone training and started carrying naloxone around. And so now, I know of someone who is able to save someone else's life while they were waiting for the bus. And so that's how changing your perspective on substance use can save a life. Getting really big now, let's go back to my previous example of individuals who are experiencing homelessness. If we move away from the fact that many people who are experiencing homelessness may be junkies who don't deserve our help, and move towards the fact that everybody, including those experiencing illnesses such as addiction, are deserving of a roof over their head, then we build better infrastructures and communities that protect everyone from these experiences. 
But if we have policymakers who believe in these stereotypes, which we do, then we have policymakers who don't allocate funds to tackling the issues that lead to homelessness. Moving on to law enforcement as well, when we change our perspectives to see those who use substances not as people who should be in jail, but people who should be in rehabilitation centers, we create spaces where individuals are able to recover and get treatment rather than serving time for an illness. And this helps keep communities together. Let's also talk about healthcare real quick. Those who use substances are often seen by healthcare workers as using the system just to obtain more substances to get a fix. But if addiction is a disease and you have a healthcare system that often turns those with substance use disorders away, then how do individuals receive the help that they need? The more that addiction is viewed and talked about as a disease, the more that we move towards equitable healthcare. As you can see, changing your perspective on substance use and addiction doesn't just affect those who directly use substances. Changing your perspective on substance use and addiction helps change lives and helps save lives. It helps create better policies, better healthcare, better infrastructures, better laws, and better communities on both local and global scales. And I don't think I'm asking for a lot here. I'm just asking for you to think about how you felt when you've been labeled as something, recognize why you shouldn't do the same, and change a few words in your vocabulary. And if you want to go a bit further than that, which I do highly recommend, maybe take 15 minutes to visit your local pharmacy and pick up a naloxone kit, which are all free in Canada, or advocate for harm reduction tactics and stigma reduction in your own communities. But really at the root of it all, I'm just asking for you to see those who use substances or experience addiction as people who are not any less than any other person out there. I'm asking for compassion and understanding and kindness and hoping that with enough of it, we can change the world. Thank you.